and we're live. We're all set, Judy. So this is the uh, September 17th um, New Report Affordable Housing Committee Housing uh, Housing Trust Committee, uh, City New Report, and we've got uh, Madeline Nash, myself, Judy Timon, Madeline Nash, Suzanne Cameron, and staff, Kate Sullivan and Andy Port. Um, so the first item on our agenda was Tiffany. Um, has t I guess Tiffany has not called in yet? Uh, no, uh, Judy, it looks like uh, she's there, and so is Karen also. We can probably move Karen over to the panelist list, too. Yeah. Oh, Karen, Karen Wiener is here as well. So is, did you say Tiffany was there? Yeah, I've just promoted them to panelists, so they should be able to unmute and speak uh, along with everyone else. Hi, everybody. Hi, Karen. Hi. So is everybody all set? Is everybody uh, comfortable with their connection? Yep. So, Madeline, I like the birds on your wall. This is my daughter's bedroom, which I have maintained unchanged for the last eight years. So you could analyze that if you want to, <laughs> but. <laughs> We'll ask you 20 years from now. <laughs> <laughs> Judy, are you going to run the agenda? Well, yeah, I, I thought we were going to um, get Tiffany on. Oh, I'm here. Can you not oh, see you me? Oh, you are. Oh, okay. I am. Okay, great. Okay, so um, Tiffany Negro from um, Pet and Gill House is here, and she is uh, going to um, give us an update on the... Um, rental assistance, emergency rental assistance program. So we did rec receive your uh, report yep. from updated 9-11. Yep. Um, so on that report, you saw that um, we've assisted nine households to date, um, including 10 adults, one elder, and four children. Um, we do have at this point 15 applications that are pending. Um, eight since we, we last met in August. Um, so some of it, um, the difference of like seven have been pending for several months. Um, I think it, it's just, it could be the client themselves or the landlord that we're still waiting back on for paperwork. Um, some of it's the bank statement that they'll just send the first page, but we're looking for the complete bank statement um, to see, especially like if they're getting unemployment um, or some other type of income and that's how they're using it as verification, we're looking for all, all pages. So um, I think things are going well um, that I feel like um, the, there's been more exposure. I know that there was another, um, you know, the mayor did some more uh, PR I know that it's been put out on Facebook. We've been working with um, the Essex County Asset Builders and Family to Family. Um, there were cards that went out all through the local food pantries. Um, so we received three referrals through that process. Um, so I think, I don't know if families, what we're seeing with some of the families that have applied that received unemployment, um, they didn't use their unemployment to pay for some of their rent. Some did, but some didn't pay at all. Um, so there, some of them are quite far behind. Um, so I'm hoping with this moratorium being lifted, if, if in fact it is lifted in October, that we don't get this surge of families um, and individuals that haven't paid since March. Um, the moratorium gets lifted and then 
you know, they're hundreds, thousands of dollars behind. So, um, because then that's a, a big crisis. So we were continuing to, you know, to, to reach families, kind of uh, help them before the crisis hits, come up with, um, you know, some strategies to be able to pay their rent. Um, because unfortunately, it, the issue is continuing. Um, you know, jobs uh, have been lost because businesses have closed, hours have been cut, um, and, you know, families have had to stay home because of the remote or hybrid learning. So, um, and we're waiting on Congress for this new stimulus package. So, um, so I'm trying to stay positive. You know, we're here to help families and, and support them the best we can with, with the rental funds and other support, um, support services. But, um, you know, our goal is to, to reach the families um, now before it becomes a crisis. Um, and they are getting an eviction letter. So hopefully that doesn't happen and we can, and we can work with landlords. I know that was brought up last time about um, asking about forgiveness. Like can, can we, um, you know, if they're $4,000 behind, is the landlord willing to forgive a certain amount? So, um, you know, the, the, the tenant can pay a portion, we could pay a portion and the landlord in essence would help pay a portion. And so, um, so um, I think that some of it too, I, I've gotten a little feedback um, just from the staff about some of the people that have applied is, um, oh, I didn't realize I could apply online. So they were calling, waiting for a paper app. And we said, oh no, there's an online portal. So I think, you know, it's, it's still fairly new. So I think it's just providing that um, education. We, um, are still encouraging to apply for raft funding. Um, I know that um, Bob Gould is back at Community Action. So he was away for quite some time this past summer. So, you know, working with him and families to get some raft funding um, if they're eligible. And um, they're offering more, um, they meaning like community teamwork who um, runs the raft program, they're offering more of the workshops um, for families because sometimes they were running only like one workshop um, and, and that's difficult sometimes for families that, that are working but still need the financial assistance. So they're offering um, both in English and Spanish um, multiple times a week, so. Um, I think that's a quick, quick update in a nutshell. Um, Tiffany, are those CPI trainings virtual? Yes, yes. That's great. Yep, there's links that they can uh, log on and, um, and zoom in, yeah. So are you finding that landlords are providing some relief? So we haven't, um, we haven't had any at this point. Um, there are a few that have um, that are overseen by property management companies that I think because they have more flexibility for maybe an individual that um, owns a home um, that we may be able to get a little bit of um, forgiveness. But no, to, to date, we haven't had any. And um, you had mentioned that there were 15 pending. Mm -hmm. So that's um, even more than what's on your, your um, report to us. So there's- Yes, because there was, there's yeah. some new ones that have come in. Yeah, even since um, we sent the report on the 11th. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah. One thing I was thinking about is Tiffany, when you said um, if the moratorium expires October 17th about that kind of tsunami. Um, yeah. But you know, I was just on a call today, and I guess if it does expire October 17th, then the federal moratorium is going to kick in, and that's oh. through the end of the year. Oh, great! So it's just kind oh. of kicking the can down the road. But yeah, yeah, and and I mean, not that we want to see anyone evicted ever, but it's I don't even know how anyone could even do that during winter, right? And place displace families and individuals, um, and and there's not enough housing. There's not enough shelter. Um, so there, there has to be, 
some more thought about how we're actually going to get out of this housing crisis. Um, and they don't have the infrastructure at the, um, at the courthouses. Once a, a landlord actually puts it into motion to actually be held before a judge, um, that's gonna, I don't know how many people would be in that situation, but I would, I would assume it would take, I don't know, years maybe to, to actually get everyone into court and to actually get the process, so. Um, I'm also, uh, a couple of our staff um, at the end, end of the month are going to be on a webinar with the Department of Housing and Community Development through the state. Um, and it's a training around, um, it's around the state shelter, assisting families that are becoming homeless. So I, I'm curious to see if there's going to be any amendments to their rule, because generally, if you've been in the system within that year, you're not allowed to re-enter. But if there are families that are, are facing eviction, if they do, in fact, you know, say it's January, February, the next year, and they've been in the shelter system, I, I can only imagine that they have to have some leniency um, to allow families into the system. So, so more will follow on that. Um, there's got to be new policies written around that. So, um, let's see. I think, I think Tiffany, that, uh, are you are you concerned um, about these families, these 15 families that are pulling together their paperwork and stuff? Are you concerned that some, you know, that this is too hard for them to get their applications in? Or do you, are you confident that if they really need the help, they'll get you what you need? Um, well, some have been pending for some time since, um, one one was so let's see a few have been actually since july um and again we look at self-sufficiency because we want to make sure that they're stable that they're following the process that they're applying for unemployment if they hadn't filed for unemployment that um cause there was a situation um a gentleman i guess his mom lived with them and then she moved out with another family member and then some roommates moved in and they moved out so he can't financially afford it on his own so we don't want to not not we don't want to but it doesn't make sense to provide money if they can't self-sustain that rent beyond like we're coming up with right. some of like okay you are an elder and you qualify for elderly public housing and it's self-determination and again we don't want to see anyone evicted but it's really just educating them about um, like what is available, what your options are, and what what the outcome may be if you don't follow through. So, um, so yeah, th there are some concerns about some of the, the people that have applied haven't followed through even to date. It's been like a month or so. Um, like, one of them also hasn't provided doc documentation for the landlord, hasn't given permission. So that's part of it. Like we do a landlord verification. We get a W-9 from the landlord. You know, are they tenant in good standings overall? I know that's a difficult situation that they haven't paid their rent, but like prior to COVID, were they paying on time? And have they showed good faith to at least pay something? Um, and like, and we do, you know, what are they in arrears to date? So, um, so, you know, we're, we keep following up emails, calls. Um, it is hard because we're still not face to face and we won't be. Um, so everything that we're providing is remote. Um, we do curbside at our, our pantry um, and we could always do curbside like at their house or like a porch curbside. Um, but but yeah, I mean, I, the, the thought and the hope is if they need the help that they're going to follow through and we're patient, we'll give time. Um, but I don't, you know, and we try to remove barriers and, and work with them and, you know, come up with creative solutions, but um, um, I, you know, it's just, we don't, we don't want anyone, like I said, to, to be in the situation that they're evicted, so. Right. 
and unfortunately like the because the that stimulus of the six hundred dollars went away there's there's you know some of the residents can't afford the the um the rent um we had an individual that had moved prior just prior to um to covid has a pretty significant rental amount um and really can't afford it um so again it's what what is the solution for her it is to to move to find more more of affordable housing um you know she's a young child so it's she has to be there for child care or find an alternative a, a friend or family member that can help when the child is remote at this point um, or hopefully get a job that she can work from home uh, remotely but but that's in a perfect world which you know we're not living in right now so um, so at this point we're thankful that the the moratorium is protecting families um, well while we kind of figure things out with them and and come up with some additional solutions so And there's no, I don't have your chart in front of me, but there's no one that is bumping up against. I think we have a $3,000 maximum. Is that right? I think it was 4,500. Yeah, 45. 45. Okay. And there's okay. nobody that's bumping up against that. that well, so there's three that are, I think there's three. Let me see. There's a few that have actually um, received the 45 yeah. over um, the three months. So what will happen to those people? I mean, I, I don't expect you to have the answer. But I know, I know. And it's, um, it is, it is, um, so what we're doing and what I work with um, the staff member that is taking the applications and, and following up is like, let's call them back, let's reassess um, for this next month, especially if the last month that we helped was September and that was their third month. Like, what is the plan? Um, has unemployment come back? Are they able to afford it? Have they found a job? Um, you know, is there some other um, funding in the area that can help? Um, because again, it's, it's to no fault of their own. It's just, um, but yeah, there are, looks like three that have um, hit the maximum amount. Three. Three out of the nine. Oh, right, 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 right. Well, that's so, concerning so we, to me. Yes, yeah, so we, you mentioned raft. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, that's still hopefully a, I know. an option. Right. Raft and Irma, so at least if somebody's at 80%. Right. Yeah. But, yeah. It's a concern. Well, do we do we want um, to consider um, uh, you know suggesting to to Tiffany that Pattengill let us know if there's a need for um, making an exception to this forty five hundred dollar max. I'm, I'm just throwing that out there. I, I think it's good to be notified. I'm hesitant once you start exceptions, okay. it's a slippery slope. And I feel like we need to be unbiased in the way that we're allocating funds. Um, you know, we, if we're finding there's a lot of people it's affecting, we could consider allowing a higher maximum. You know, we're going back, but I'm a, a mm -hmm. little hesitant about exceptions unless it seems really kind of extraordinary. And right. I would, I mean, I would it, definitely right do that if right we've exhausted all avenues and um, and if if they received RAF funding or some extenuating circumstance, absolutely, I could reach out and you know provide an update. But again, that's what I was talking about before, like coming with, up with some creative solutions about um, and doing check-ins like for the families that have reached the max. Um, I know there is one that she has a child, she um, receives a big social security and she was actually working part-time but the part-time job 
is not um, obviously because she's home with her child, but she may be able to make ends meet with with unemployment. So um, so it, mal it may be helping in, in other areas like okay, let's see if your food stamps are maximized and, you know, let's help with our food pantries and let's make sure that, um, you know, if you need a clothing voucher because you're, you, we don't want you to spend money on clothing if, cause that's an expense. So, um, so yeah, just working with our partners to see what we can do. I really appreciate you taking that holistic view too. I think that's mm -hmm. great. Well, yeah, that's the advantage of having pet and gill work. Yeah, it is. So, it yeah. is. Mm -hmm. Right, and because we don't want the families to feel like it's like it's endless and the help's there, like they have to empower themselves and, you know, continue to, to look for employment and not um, to, you know, really feel like, oh, I have X amount of dollars before I exhaust my employment, right? It's let's if you're able to to get back to work right okay any other questions for tiffany no. judy can i just make can i just make a comment john hi yes, sure john, john. I, I know it's, it hasn't been with uh, Newburyport funds but uh, Pettengill, Pettengill has been extremely helpful in Salisbury with a number of our tenants, um, and it's been fabulous working with them. Uh, we've been able to aggressively go after the RAF funds and then the CDBG funds that uh, Salisbury made available through Pettengill House. And between those two, it, it's been a lifesaver for so many of our uh, tenants. And, and having that, that resource available um, and being able to go through Pettengill for our tenants has just been wonderful. That's great. great Good to hear. John. <laughs> Thanks. Good to know. Yeah, and I know, and I'd mentioned the the um, the family to family, and that's that specifically we had um, like our our social work kind of uh, little task force come together, and Ellie Davis from the Y was was on um, on the task force, and we're getting a lot of referrals that way. Um, and again, it's like. Ellie saying, no, that's that's one of our residents. So we, we do a lot of collaboration and, and making sure that families are stabilized. So great. It's a great community. Great greater new report community. <laughs> right. Right. Because we can't we can't do it in isolation, that's for sure. Yeah. Yeah, well, thank you. Good job. Thanks very much, Tiffany. Thank you. Yeah, anything else for Tiffany before she leaves? Okay, thanks, Tiffany. Thanks for the update. Right. Thank thanks. You. Okay, so next on the agenda is an update on the YWCA Cottage Court uh, project. And we have John Fian here, Executive Director of the YWCA. Hi, John. Hello. Um, thank you for giving me this chance to talk about Hillside. Uh, Hillside. Um, so we do have some good news finally to report. Um, things have finally started getting back on track and um, we have a tentative construction start date of October 19th. Uh, that is dependent on getting all the permits in place right now, which I believe David Hall is working on. and. Um, also um, the getting the bids in. So um, it's changed a little bit. Um, David Hall has actually contracted out the construction to LD Russo. So at least we're very familiar with who's gonna be building it. Um, Nat's been working to try to get the uh, prices together and to get finalized prices um, and then get the subs lined up to start the work. But they, you know, fingers crossed, they're gonna start October 19th. Um, so, I, you know, I think everybody's aware we've had a number of setbacks. Um, some of them were technical and some of them were, I, I, I don't know, I can't, you know, <laughs> it, we're, we're not in charge of this project in the sense that we're buying a turnkey building from David Hall. Um, so we're kind of dependent on him to get the project going. 
but some of the technical problems that we faced um, when we when when they moved to make it a passive house design, um, passive housing is more for single family type. Um, units. So in all his other units, it's one family who's living in, a, in an apartment. And that's not the case for what we've got in a lodging house. We've got 10 different people living there in 10 separate rooms with 10 separate doors that stay closed all the time. So the technical challenge on this was trying to make sure that the ventilation uh, and the HVAC was going to be adequate uh, both to make sure that people were comfortable, but then also to make sure that the air circulation was sufficient um, and met the, uh, you know, the, the goals of, of what you have to do for, for air circulation. Oddly enough, one of the challenges with this house was that um, normally you would do some level of dehumidification using an air conditioner. Um, and when they looked at trying to put an air conditioner in, because of the design of the frame of the building, they literally could not find a small enough air conditioner that would run constantly um, through the day and, and do the dehumidification. Um, so they ended up having to do some, um, some other device called a, a Zender air handling unit, um, which makes me a little bit nervous because it's really kind of way out there cutting edge um, type of uh, stuff. But so they've, they've designed it now in with those different uh, mechanical units into it. And that's set it back several months. Uh, and then, of course, the whole um, crisis with COVID set it back another um, set of months. And, and um, so it's just been a challenging project. But uh, the good news is I think we're back on track now to, to getting it done. So it sounds like um, he's looking to get the foundation in in October. I don't know. We, hopefully more than that. <laughs> um, you know, when we did the 11 Market Street, we didn't start that until February. Um, so uh, I, we're, we've got a, an unfortunate history of starting these projects uh, when it's really cold out. <laughs> I remember. <laughs> Um, and, and LD Russo has been good, you know, I mean, it, as long as the weather cooperates and, and they can pour the cement and, and get the things in, you know, um, then there have been troopers and have, you know, weather, you know, gone right through the, the bad weather. So. Yeah. So what's the, what's the total construction time? Was it a year or? or well, they're hoping months? for nine, they're hoping for nine months. Um, but I've learned that LD Russo nine months is more like 10, 11. Um, and, it, it's, and that's, I mean, when we did Salisbury, um, they hit a crisis where the, um, the HVAC was running a little bit behind. Um, but then that pushed the next contractor who was doing the drywall way behind. And so we had the whole place done and we were waiting for the, um, the guy to come in and do the mudding of the walls for the for the drywall, and we just sat around and twiddled our thumbs for several weeks while we waited for somebody to show up and do that work. Um, so it's you know it's sometimes it's beyond their control in terms of um, you know getting things implemented. I, I am a little concerned on on pushing this project too quickly, um, simply because there are some of the some of the mechanicals are really technical and. We want to make sure that we get a couple sets of eyes on them um, as the process goes along, because I'm not sure there are systems that Matt is familiar with in terms of installing, or any anybody local is, to be honest. So. Uh, John, um, I have two questions. One is, <clears throat> my recollection is that the Tenants will have their own bathroom, but it's shared kitchens. Is that correct? That's correct. How is your feeling about that now with COVID-19 problems? <laughs> yeah, I, well, I mean, we've, we've been dealing with it for the past six months at Market Street, uh, where, we, you know, where we've got people sharing bathrooms and kitchens. Um, and what we've done is we've, we've talked with folks about, you know, making this a team effort. 
and we've been very successful with that. Um, you know, and, and people are looking out for themselves and they're looking out for each other. Uh, and they've kind of um, taken a very positive, holistic approach and we've been very successful. Um, so at, at this point in the process, I'm not sure that there's anything we could do um, because just so much time and effort and, and money has gone into the current design. And COVID is not going to be here forever. Um, you know, we, we, we will get past this eventually. Right. Um, okay. Um, and my other question is, have you given or has somebody given an update to DHCD on the status? Yes. Yeah, I just, I did one at the beginning of September and then I did another one uh, just, uh, I'm sorry, the end of August and then I did another one just two weeks ago. I just learned that the construction date was set about a week ago. Great. So far, they've been good. They've been hanging in there with us. Um, you know, and, and um, when, when the whole COVID crisis came up, I, I got in touch with them right away to let them know that, you know, we had this problem and, and, um, and they were very willing to help. I, I will say that um, in the redesign work that was done on the project, uh, we did end up doing a, a new purchase and sales with Holland Moscow that raised the total cost about $300,000. Um, so over the summer, I worked with uh, Federal Home Loan Bank and I submitted a, a, a Federal Home Loan Bank application to cover that difference. And but you don't know yet if you got that funding, right? No. So you you'll you'll find out in December, right? December, right. yeah. Um, and we do have a commitment from David Hall that until we find out of the $300,000, he will provide us essentially 0% gap funding. Um, with no principal payments until we get it funded. Do, do you, did you score well when you self-scored with the FHLB application? No. Oh. No, um, and it was beyond our control. I did everything. I actually ended up adding two homeless units um, to the mix. Um, in so much, you know, when we look at Salisbury, I think we reserved 11 units for homeless, and we ended up serving like 17 or 18 homeless households. So adding the fact that we were going to serve two homeless households was not a huge stretch for us, um, just given the population that we're serving. Um, and that got us up to like 67.7 points, and 67 is there kind of anything below that rarely gets funded. So we're, we're right on the edge. What we couldn't control was the amount that we were borrowing compared to the amount that uh, we were asking for in a grant. And so the more you borrow, because it's a bank, the more points you get. Right. Uh, and so out of 12 points, I think we got like three and a half points on that score. And, that's, <laughs> and that was it. I mean, that's what, that's what killed us. And there was nothing we could do about it. It's ironic. <laughs> <laughs> really doing so well in that way, but yeah, it's ironic. Yeah, yeah. The, the one thing you can't control is, is what dinged us the worst. Yeah. Yeah. Did you get CPA money already for this project? I can't yes, we did. Yeah. And do you remember how much? 150000 I don't and we, for more there. <laughs> Yeah, if we had to, we, you know, we, we've got a plan B, uh, and I think plan B would be, you know, Franklin Square House Foundation, um, going back to um, CPA and asking for a little bit more there, uh, and then maybe some other private foundations that I think we'd be able to do, and then a little bit of private fundraising. Um, so I'm, I'm not, you know, it, obviously, I'd like to get it all in one place at FHLB, just because it, it's easier to have. Easier. One fun, you know, one funding source versus eleven funding sources is always easier. <laughs> but you don't seem too worried about filling the gap. It seems like you feel like you can do it somehow. Yeah, yeah. We've made it through the past six months, so I figure you know we can do anything now. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> always the optimist. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, you know, it, it, it does get me. <laughs> Well, nice to see you being optimistic, John. <laughs> yeah, well, that's, Judy, that's the difference between when, when, what you get to see privately as a board member and, <laughs> and what I say publicly at all these events. <laughs> right. There you go. 
Yeah. I mean, you could go back to DHCD, but that's never a simple process. No, and timing I, is, it's not a quick process. Yeah, no, and I, I talked with them a little bit about it, and it did not get a warm reception at all. So I, I, I didn't. Okay. I didn't push on it at all. Um, and, you know, I, I kind of let them know that this is what was happening and that the, the price was going to go up and how did they want to, you know, ad address it in terms of all the performance that we submitted. And they were like, oh, just change the performance. Just don't ask us for money. And I was <laughs> like, oh, okay, well, that, that gives me my answer. So. Okay. And, I, and I've been talking with FHLB about this project for a couple of years, so they're well aware of it. Um, and at some level, Toby was the original one who encouraged me to put the bathrooms in each unit instead of having shared bathrooms. Um, so she's, she's very familiar with the program, and I, and I think she's certainly um, cheering for us to um, have this thing funded. Um, and, and plus, it's, it, it's still, it's a cutting-edge project. I mean, there are no other, you know, passive design lodging houses out there. There are no other net zero uh, lodging houses that are that are being proposed anywhere because it turns out it's really difficult to do. Yeah. Which is the other area I was thinking about for funding is, you know, from some kind of environmental groups who want to showcase it in that yeah. way. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you sound like you're really hanging in there and it's happening. So, you yeah. know, slowly, but it's happening. Which is yeah, good. that's great. Yeah. And just just a little, if you don't mind, just a little perspective on Salisbury. Um, you know, we, we've got 42 units. They're all full. Um, we have been working very aggressively with the majority of our tenants uh, around using their, you know, when they got the unemployment benefits, you know, our tenants were good and they, they paid their rents. And when they got the stimulus checks, they paid any back rent that they might have had. And then the RAF program has really been fabulous. Um, it's really, really kept our, our tenants going. Um, and so we've been successful throughout the crisis in terms of um, collecting rents and, you know, providing all the services that we've been providing over there. We really do worry that the longer this thing drags out, because a lot of our tenants are unemployed, um, and the longer this drags out, the more stretched the, the available resources are, and unless the federal government comes back up with the unemployment uh, assistance, um, you know, we worry that long term, it's, it's not going to be as easy to, to do. But at least, at least for now, we're doing well. How many of um, your tenants have mobile vouchers and how many project based vouchers do you have? Do you know? We have 16 project based vouchers. And we have, I think at last count, six mobile vouchers. And um, Newburyport Housing Authority was fabulous in um, trying to get us some, some tenants through one of the programs that they have. And I think we ended up with three of their, of their tenants, of their clients. Mm -hmm. Well, that, that helps. Yeah. And, and I know somebody mentioned earlier about landlord forgiveness. Um, and just, you know, from, you know, the, the, the forgiveness that we got on the loan for the YWCA was not forgiveness at all. It was simply a deferment of our uh, mortgage obligations. And in fact, when the mortgage starts up again next month, it's going to be 100% interest until we've paid off all the interest that accumulated over the past six months. And then we'll be able to begin paying down our principal once again. So if, if homeowners or, or, you know, or small landlords take advantage of that, uh, those kind of loan deferment programs, Long term, it really puts them in a hole. I mean, the, the banks are making out like bandits, and um, you know, the, so it, it, it's hard, I think, to ask landlords to do too much in terms of forgiveness um, because, like, nobody's forgiving them anything long term. What bank is it? What bank are you with? Institution. Wow. Yeah. Well, can't they just add that to the? tail like can't they just add it to the principal and let you pay just pick up your payments as usual um you might have thought that that's what they could have done but that's not what they did that's what a lot of banks are doing so that's yes. why i'm asking yeah yeah <laughs> yeah is there a um pressure for us to apply <laughs> to institutions 
I mean, that's just, there are banks that are definitely doing more of a forbearance kind of thing, you know, yeah. that are, are putting yeah. it at the end and not charging interest and all that. I'm really, I'm frankly quite surprised to hear that yeah. and dismayed. Well, I, I haven't hit them up for a big donation yet, but um, um, we will be doing that soon. Offset it, yeah. Yeah. So on the, um, so has Pettengill been helping you get the raft? They've helped us both a little bit with raft. Uh, you know, Ellie's been working very closely with them. Um, but then once we get raft, some of our tenants need a little bit extra help. Um, and then Pettengill's been very, very good at, at working with us to get the extra help. They've been helpful in terms of, as Tiffany was saying, getting that, that wider range of services. Um, you know, I think back in, what was it, March and April, Ellie very quickly went around to, to all our tenants and, and Jillian did the same and said, you've got to apply for unemployment and here's how. And they, and they helped them get onto the unemployment. Um, and then Pettengill was helpful in, in other ways in terms of food stamps and, uh, you know, in food assistance and, you know, some of those other different programs. But I, I know that Jillian, Ellie, and, and Pettengill have been working very closely together for a, a lot of our tenants. And any COVID in the development? We have been very fortunate. Um, as far as we know, there's been nobody. That's great. Yep. That's great. And, and we did reopen our preschool program in July. Um, so it's open as well. So if you know folks that are looking for childcare, um, and we do it on a sliding fee. So, if, you know, uh, lower income working folks, we can work with them and we accept vouchers and um, try to get that program back up to full. And keep COVID out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Here's the trick. <laughs> okay, anything else for John? That was a great update. Yes, thank you very much, John. Thanks a lot, John. You're welcome. This is a great format. It, it, um, I, I know we'd all rather be around the table <laughs> saying hi to each other, but uh, being able to do this through this medium is, is is wonderful. So thank you for the opportunity. Sure. Thanks for being here. But the construction is going to be starting next month or soon thereafter. That's great. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. All righty. Good night. Good night. All right. Okay. Next on the agenda. Can I just say before we move on, I'm outraged about institution. What the hell? I mean, there's, there's supposed to be this wonderful community bank. And this is what they're doing. I, I, not that I can do anything about it. I'm just, I'm very surprised. I'm very surprised and very dismayed. Yeah, see, I, I have nothing to uh, judge that against. I don't know, maybe Suzanne knows more. And certainly you, you guys know more than I do as to what the banks are doing and what they're allowing. I yeah, have... now the, it's uh, typically, um, well, at least in our world, um, we're seeing that um, the 90 day principal and interest added to the to the principal of the mortgage. So it's basically added back back in. But when the payments resume, there's no payment shock and there's nothing to pay down and just keep paying. You just have that, you know, when you go to pay off, you have that little extra. Um, yeah, so which makes it easier. And it just means, you know, it, it's it's you just have a longer I mean, I've heard from a couple of CDCs, it's just so we were supposed to pay this off in 10 years, we're going to pay it off in 12 years or whatever. But or not even, yeah, you know, yeah. It, it really depends. I mean, you, and, if, and if things go back to normal, you can make a couple principal payments and, you know, you're back to where you need to be. But, but the thing that, that sort of, um, you have interest only until you pay it off and then that's, that's, that's crazy. cumbersome. Yeah, especially for a nonprofit, you know, I would think. Yeah. There should be a way to negotiate, but... Who knows? I mean, I assume John tried that, but I, yeah. I just, well, I don't know what to do about it. I'm just surprised by it. And, and especially, I mean, if there was some way we could advocate, especially for, I mean, I can't speak to institution for how they handle most businesses, but, you know, a nonprofit that's trying to provide affordable housing like that, why would they do that? Yeah. Can you, um, I'm sorry, that I should have asked this earlier, but those cost overruns were related to the restrooms? Was that... 
Why uh, that? The no, the pass. It was the passive the the features that's making it so energy. You know. Oh, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's okay. probably also just time. You know, costs going up. Maybe having more firm pricing now than when they originally estimated it. I mean, that's what I was assuming, but he, he was talking about passive houses being one of the complexities of the deal. So would that be still because they haven't broken ground? Could that potentially be considered pre-development expense? Well, the design part. Yeah. That's what I was thinking. Yeah, I mean, fund it? yeah. Fund it. I, I, I'm not following. I, I was wondering, Suzanne, if you're thinking of a way to, to fund yeah, that. Yeah, no, I was thinking of pre-development grant funds or something, you know, that would mm -hmm. help plug, uh, plug the gap. Okay. I think what they need is construction. I, mean, I think they need additional permanent funding to fill the gap. I don't think it's a pre-development challenge they have. Um, but, um, you know, John didn't seem particularly concerned. I think we kind of gave him the opening to make a pitch or some additional local funds. He, didn't. he doesn't seem uh, ready to do that yet. I, and, you know, the FHLB is a great source, but it's really hard to count on it. And they won't know until December. Uh, and I don't know when in December. So that's, that's, that's hard, I think. It sounds and, like that he has a, a, a cheerleader there, which is good. Um, it's not a big place. It's, you know. Yeah, well, I don't know. I've been in his oh, shoes before and they'll tell you, oh, you've got a very competitive application, but then, you know, you don't get it. And, mm -hmm. Yeah. It, you know, it's a it's a great project, but if you don't score, you know, a certain way, and and like you said, the fact that they have very little perm debt is is hurts their scoring. So, yeah, I think my experience from what I've heard from folks, I mean, Toby's great, you know, but she is a cheerleader for everybody. I mean, she loves everybody's projects, kind of thing. So I don't know that, you know, that's just sort of her right. personality and her nature. Right, right. I think it is the scoring, you know, and they have a very um, you know, it's, it's supposed to be a, a very uh, transparent kind of process and it's, it's the scoring, so. Unlike so many other sources of funding that you can go after, it's very systematic. Right. But well, there's always not concerned, you know? I, I mean, it seems concerning to me. <laughs> he was giving us his public face, it sounded like. <laughs> yeah, there's well, a but, face. So there's always the the institution for savings to hit them up for a huge um, donation for that project. It sounds like that's the way he's going to sort of offset what they're doing with the the loan. Which, if that works, that's fine. Yeah. Well, we can move on. I just wanted to to raise that that I was a little outraged by that, but say la vie. Yep. Yep. Okay, uh, next we have um, section 6C update from uh, Andy. Yeah, um, if you don't mind, I'm just gonna change the screen uh, view right now just to show a draft document. Okay, um, can you all see this? Yes. Yep. Um, so, and Caitlin can jump in as well, but uh, I, I think Judy, and let me know if there's anything else you want to, from this, but my understanding is the Housing Trust wanted just an update of what the planning board's considering for the 6C zoning uh, section. Um, they've been talking for a, a number of years, it's come up periodically, um, changes that might make sense to the 6C section. Um, and I can summarize that in, in just a minute, but um, it's my understanding you're interested in, in what the changes are they're thinking about making right now. Um, and particularly with respect to the affordable housing uh, right. component. So I don't know if before I go over what they're looking at, do you, does anybody have any questions generically or concerns? No. Okay. Yeah, it was, yeah, it was in, in relation to their, um, the, the change for, for affordable housing is what I wanted people to know about. 
Um, right. Okay. So, uh, I mean, if, if, if no one's interested in the other aspects of the 6C change, I can sort of skip over those and just go right to the affordable housing component. Yep. Okay. So, um, if you look at this highlighted paragraph here, um, this is essentially uh, more or less what they were uh, talking about at the very last meeting. So, last night, um, this is conceptually what they're talking about making a when someone wants to do a second dwelling unit that's on a on a on a you know a, a, a lot with two structures on it, um, ten square ten dollars per square foot is is how it's multiplied to determine the amount of money they need to give to the housing trust fund. Um, they there was talk several years back I don't remember how many years back at this point but there was discussion at one point about having almost like a table in this section of the ordinance that would specify based on a project size. Um, you know what the amount might be, but uh, this is where they're thinking right now going um, to basically say if someone's going to be creating a, a market rate unit, um, then they have to contribute, you know, ten dollars per square foot of the eval of the size of that unit. There was also discussion in, the, in that conversation about whether or not that would help also to reduce the sizes of uh, the second unit being, you know, constructed. Maybe they just sort of balance out what they'd have to pay. And that might reduce the other si the size of the other unit, and therefore that might have a benefit, like a sort of a almost like a little a affordability um, impact, if you will. Uh, but that's in summary what they're thinking about right now. Okay, so we so don't often see the six C section used with uh, affordable housing. Just FYI. Well, that was my question. Was um, that was one question, Andy, and my second was where does the ten dollars per square foot come from? Is that used elsewhere? I'm just curious. Uh, no, I don't recall there being mention of exactly where that number came from. Um, I believe that Don Walters and Tanya Hartford, there was some sort of discussion they had had about that, but um, they had done some looking at other communities and, and of course, not to anybody's surprise, I think found that there wasn't really a comparable provision they could find somewhere else that was a good sort of example to, to glean off of. Um, but we can find out, we can uh, circle back with them, we can find out and uh, let you know where that sort of originated from. There was, I should mention, by the way, there was some discussion. Uh, I think it was Bonnie who had suggested because, again, they've been playing around with, um, you know, any type of structure or formula for, um, because basically projects are not usually of a size where someone can absorb an entire unit being built, right? Ideally, you want them to build the unit and not defer it to a later date. Um, the city or the trust would then have to spend money on mobilizing a contractor. Um, whereas if the development's already underway, you know, there's a cost savings there. So um, it makes more sense to have them actually build the unit. I think you all know that. Um, and, and that's the preference in your inclusionary ordinance. But, um, but you know, their assumption here with most of the six C's that they've gotten over the years. Um, and by the way, they were at one point discussing the possibility of even deleting the six C section, but that's another whole um, debate. But uh, when the 6C section is used, they, they're typically smaller projects, you know, one or two houses on a lot. Um, and oftentimes we're seeing now the preservation restriction being proposed as the so-called public benefit. Um, but the projects aren't big enough with just two units for someone to say, yeah, I'll, I'll contribute or make one of those affordable, um, you, know, you know, based on any other ratios we've seen. And so they are, the debate has always been, well, what's enough of a contribution to the housing trust to satisfy that type of public benefit? So they just, yeah. They just, is this a starting point? What's it? Is this a, is this a starting point? Or can we can we try to up the ante here or what? Oh yeah, I mean, it's the, right now, if you're talking about negotiation, you're only negotiating with the planning board. The uh, the city council ultimately will adopt this. So right now, this is being conceived of as a planning board recommendation to the city council to modify the six C section. Um, you know, we'll, we'll confirm who might be the sponsor on the council for the amendment, but certainly uh, there could be conversation about how to adjust this and whether or not this is the right structure to use either. Um, Bonnie had brought up the concept, at least uh, for discussion purposes, of saying, well, what what's the what's the value of the market rate unit, which I think you can only really determine by some sort of appraisal um, or comps out there, but what's the value of the market rate unit minus, you know, what's an affordable unit, you know, going for right now. Um, and you sort of, well, if you take that gap in there, maybe that's what they have to give to, you know, the affordable housing trust. So there's different ways to do this. And the, the planning board has discussed this in different ways over the years 
feeling like the results of 6C are sort of mixed and not necessarily a whole lot of affordable housing maybe coming from it. So um, this was this is essentially an attempt to sort of codify a threshold for a, a payment in lieu type scenario. That's a huge difference, Andy. I mean, if you're talking about the difference between, I mean, a, a, I don't know how big a new house is. Say it's 1,500 square feet, that's $15,000 as opposed to if you're comparing a market rate unit to the, an affordable rate, you're talking, you know, 100,000 or something like that. Um, I, and that's not what I'm suggesting. Like more than 100,000. Hmm? More, yeah, 200,000 even, I mean, three, I mean, depending, you know. Right. Yeah, how, how high end it is. It seems so like I, a very low, low dollar amount. Yeah, it doesn't seem like much to me, but I, again, I don't, it's more than what we were getting, right? right. It's more, even at the 10, if you're looking at a 2,500 square foot dwelling, you're talking about 25,000. If you up it, it's, you know, more, you know, 37,5 or whatever, you know? So it's significantly more than what we have been getting. True. So, but I, I'd still like to, <laughs> to push this up to 15 or 20 would be really nice, but. Yeah, and I, maybe if that, I mean, wherever you come out tonight or if you want to continue this discussion, I know that they, I don't know exactly what the time frame will be for the council to take up this amendment as after the planning board submits it, but, um, you you know, if you're able to either tonight or at a future meeting, um, recommend a specific change to this, whether it's, you know, the dollar amount or something else, then we can transfer that or convey that to the planning board. Uh, um, or you can, of course, attend the, the hearing that's going to happen on this at some point. Um, but in either way, it might might be able to influence or change what's initially proposed to the city council um, when it goes into the docket. So, so what? It, when are they planning to submit it? Uh, well, my my sense is that they just want to do another review of this at their next meeting, um, and then uh, you know, basically, I, I'm just basically going to take uh, a couple of there's a couple of other changes in here that are not related to affordable housing. And so I was just gonna tweak that to reformat it into uh, a proper amendment to be put before the city council. Um, and there's a couple of other things in here, like I said, that are being adjusted, but it's, it's more to deal with like neighborhood compatibility issues. And um, so at any rate, the uh, you know, I, I suspect after the next meeting that they'll want to um, forward that as a recommendation to the city council and then defer to the council on what the time frame might be for scheduling the hearing. Well, let's suggest that they make it 20 instead of 10. What's a typical new, you know, a new dwelling, a, a second dwelling on a lot? What would the typical size of that be? Anybody, do you have any idea, Andy? Uh, I mean, to me, it seems conceivable that these, these units are going to be, you know, in excess of 1,500 square feet. They're going to be at 2,000 square foot, you know. Okay. Um, I, they seem to be larger units from what I can see, what, what's been done over the time that I've been here. Um, not, you know, sm they're not really small accessory small. units, okay. they're, they're whole okay. new houses. They're full, yeah. yeah. And that's, that's been one of the concerns that was been raised by plenty board members who support affordable housing, you know, saying, well, are we really achieving any affordability if we're just creating another market rate unit? You know, they're getting a substantial amount of value on these lots. Um, we're giving them a relief, you know, to allow them to have that second dwelling on the lot, but, you know, shouldn't we be getting more out of that? So uh, that goes back to the, the, maybe the number here, but. Yeah, let's make it 25. Right. <laughs> they can negotiate it down. Did, did you say there's no sponsor yet or? Uh, I don't believe they've confirmed a sponsor yet. Uh -huh. um, yeah. So I hear 25. Well, and I mean, I think it's a starting, you know, I think, whatever. I don't, <laughs> anyone going for 30? <laughs> Do I hear 30? I don't know. It's sort of arbitrary. But. It is. I mean, it is arbitrary. I mean, but if they're, they've only, they're going to discuss it once more. Right. Um, I mean, when I've talked to Bonnie about this, they were thinking about giving money to the open space committee. So at least that, that changed. Well, we certainly can propose 30. I mean, I don't know the politics of this and, you know, if we go too high, if it's just crazy, but it really isn't that crazy. I mean, $60,000, if it's a 2,000 square foot house, $60,000 still doesn't even come close to uh, building a new unit, but you know, obviously it, it does help us to, to help someone do that. Yep. 
Yeah. yeah. I mean, these homes are probably going for, you know, just under a million when they're done anyway. So yeah. <laughs> it's right. a small drop in the bucket if someone is able to pay that amount of money to, you know, make a contribution here, whether it's through the, the initial developer or the person who's ultimately buying it. These buyers will come in and put $60,000 into heating their driveway. Right, right, right. <laughs> or putting in their um, outdoor TV and their uh, outdoor patio and everything else we see happening. So, yeah. So, I so move that we suggest that the amount be $30 per square foot. Second. I'll second. All in favor? <laughs> yeah. muted. I don't, I don't know if it's it's easy. If we end up at, you know, whatever, it's easy. It's easy to start where we're starting than to try to jack it up later. So. Oh, I definitely. Think. Definitely. Yeah. So, yeah. And so Kayla and I can pass that feedback on to them and maybe that will be, um, you know, absorbed and incorporated into it before they recommend to the city council. And that way it'll be less of a, you know, you won't be negotiating up during the public hearing. You'll be, uh, if anybody wants to try to push down, they'd have to do it from there. So. Okay, good. Okay. Thank you. All right, Thank you. Andy. Uh, what's next? Updates? Any other updates? Other updates from the planning office? I think Kate updated us on um, the resales in the staff report. Yep, I provided a few um, updates, but I did send around the um, RFP for, you know, home funds. Um, so and those are due, I believe, October, end of October, October 23rd. Um, so I just wanted to know if we wanted to have a quick discussion about that at this meeting, since that date is coming up quickly. Yeah, I would also add to that, um, I, I've only been involved in one or two cycles of that. Um, you know, typically the, the staff planner is dealing with that, working with the housing trust, but, um, and the mayor. But it, it's a relatively, compared to some of the programs that, you know, we're, we're talking about a municipal vulnerability preparedness grant and, and some other grants like that from the federal and state government. And those are very complicated, but this is a relatively straightforward program that I think is well worth a little bit of time. Um, if you can propose something, um, you know, it's, it's a smooth funding process and um, certainly, you know, the funds could be used. So I, I would definitely suggest going after it if you, if you and the mayor can agree on whatever that priority should be. Do you have any suggestions on what the program would be, what the use of funds would be? Uh, I do not at this point. I'd, I'd want to read their most recent um, uh, material just to see if they if there's a particular uh, area that they're focused on this time around. Is that where we got down payment assistance from in the past? Uh, CPC, CBA is given down payment assistance, right? The, I yeah, think that's they right. used to do that, but I don't think they do anymore. Okay. So um, one thing that I noticed in here was um, rental assistance. And I, I had thought that um, home funds were rather cumbersome in terms of um, requirements. Reporting. I may be wrong, but that's that's what I recall. All right, cumbersome in what way? Um, cumbersome in, in that um, they require the environmental review, um, and I, I I just remember I remember offering our home funds even to to John Fian, and he didn't want to take it on because of the. The um, the paperwork involved and the requirements involved. Would it, would it make sense? Um, I mean, obviously we can't. He's not on right now, but maybe circling back with him and just um, refreshing what that issue was and seeing if that has some bearing on how you want to proceed with this. Yes. Yeah, anybody else have any comments on that? No, who knows more about? Uh, I think home fun home funding is extremely bureaucratic. I think you're absolutely right, Judy. But I think. I guess what I would suggest, I, I, when I worked in Salem at the CDC there, I used to go to the North Shore Home Consortium meetings. They're held regularly and all the you know towns that are part of the consortium attend and they talk about how they're using their funds. And it used to be, uh, the small towns used to 
do the down payment assistance. That's, that was the only thing going for them, you know? Um, now a lot of the area nonprofits use it for their development initiatives because they're fortunate enough to have a development initiative. Um, and so then the nonprofit deals with all that bureaucratic stuff. Um, and they're well equipped to do it because they've got the staff and they've got a, they're maybe using home funds from the state anyway. So this is just another layer of bureaucracy that they're already dealing with. Um, but it could be that some of the communities in our consortium area are doing something innovative with these local home funds. I have no way of knowing. Um, it seems like it's worth you know, there might be some information on their website. Kevin Hurley is really approachable. He's a great source of information. Um, I think we've talked before about reaching out to him and finding out what other communities are doing using these home funds. I'm concerned that maybe we don't have time now because applications are due in October. Um, I, I don't know. Uh, I'll take a look at the RFP. I didn't do that before this meeting, um, but you know, it, it seems like it would have been possibly a good thing for John Fian to do for this Y project, um, you know, as a as a way to fill this gap. But I, I think he. It sounds like he wants to keep it as simple as possible. Um, I don't. I, I can't. I remember him re like you were saying, Judy. I remember him kind of rejecting using yeah. home funds in the past because he didn't feel it was worth the, the bureaucratic. But in this case, he is working with some DHCD funding already. True. Um, but he probably knows about this funding source. Yeah, I mean, it, I'm just looking at it here. I mean, we've got Davis-Bacon requirements. We've got uniform administrative, um, affirmative marketing, environmental review, um, lead-based pain abatement, um, flood provisions. I mean, some of those are standard in any, um, you know, mortgage applications, but some of them are not. Um, well, Davis-Bacon would not apply unless certain things trigger it. And most of the uses of these home funds work around the threshold requirements that trigger Davis-Bacon. So I don't, I'm, but it, you know, you do this municipality or whomever has to do an environmental review. It's not that hard, but it is something that has to be done. And then I think there's a lot of reporting requirements over time. Right. But you work hand in hand with the North Shore Home Consortium. I mean, that's what they do. They work with all these, I think it's like 27 municipalities in the area. And, and many of them are very small, don't have much administrative capacity. So I mean, I think it can be done. It's just, I'm not sure we have enough time to pull it all together. Well, I guess the question is then for what? I mean, like if the Brown, if something was happening with the Brown School right now, you know, I'd say that would be a great potential source, but that's obviously not relevant right now. Um, okay. Right. I would think rental assistance would be complicated. I mean, when you think about, you know, a, a, administering a rental assistance program. That sounds very complicated to me. Yeah. But. yeah, that's what's needed out there. But I mean, I get occasionally I just get, um, you know, Sue McKittrick will send me an email saying, do you know of any, you know, either units or any source Funding source for rental assistance. That comes up, you know, once or twice, once every few months, I get an email from her about that. Um, but yeah, have, that would require that, you know, Caitlin, our staff person, would be running a, you know, that was something similar to the housing rehab program, and that was a full time job. Yeah. I don't think we want to go there. It's not a huge pot of money either, is it? Is it like 1.5 million or something? That's what I saw. I'm not trying to be a naysayer. I just, I, I feel like it's something maybe we should consider for the future. I mean, we can investigate it now, but maybe this is something to think more seriously about for next year. Yeah. I, I'm glad it's been brought to our attention because I think it is an interesting opportunity. I just, I'm just concerned that we don't have time to pull the other program. Yeah, the total amount is 1.5. Yeah. 
Yep. Um, so we do we want to do a little bit, you know, our research and then kind of circle back. Um, because I think last year, I think there was a, you know, a vote, I guess, to release the funds back into like the pool of funding. Um, I remember last year we did that. Um, so maybe at our next meeting, we can kind of circle back after we've looked at the RFP a little bit more um, and talk about it in like two or three weeks. So there's a certain amount that is allocated to Newburyport, is that correct? Yeah, there's an allocation for new report, but you can also apply for additional funds. I think that's the question here. Do we know how much the allocation is? Uh, I don't off the top of my head. Um, I, I remember there being something in the area of like 60,000 the last time I was involved with it, but I don't know, Caitlin, do you know, or have you, is that in the documentation? It's probably yeah, not in this. I don't have uh, that particular... non number open right now, no. Okay. Yeah, so we can check with Kevin Hurley and just confirm that uh, for you. But the question here is whether you want to go beyond that. Yeah, I hate to turn down potential money. I'm just not sure how we would use it right now. Right. Yeah, I mean, I feel like if we had an affordable housing development initiative going right. on, we might be able to help the developer access these funds. I thought they were looking for units more than anything else. For preservation, something. Well, they do. They do mention um, rental assistance. That's one of the um, creation of units, expanding the supply. Not listed in any order of preference. Expanding the supply create permanent, affordable, assist people with disabilities, um, families, of course, those are the priorities. So yeah, it does sound like it's creation of units. That would be great. Let's get that Brown School going. Add a couple of units. <laughs> Yeah, everybody's all for social justice these days. So let's right. get your money where you matter, people. Yeah, uh, the, uh, this is Andy again. Just with respect to the Brown School, I assume Kaylin's been updating you on this, but um, you know, it seems it seems pretty likely now, pretty um, certain that Youth Services is going to stay at the Brown School. Um, that the feasibility study has not actually been presented yet. Um, it's being finalized and will present in the coming weeks or months, but. Um, but it seems based on what I know right now that it's, it's more likely there'll be the expectation that youth services will stay there with the first floor. So if the, just to the extent that that gives you any help in thinking about what might happen at the Brown School for affordable housing or even market rate housing, um, it sounds like we're really talking about, again, this is all with the presumption the city's gonna retain the building, um, which requires a fair amount of investment, um, that it will actually be a smaller project. And it's only gonna be a two story, project because it's only going to be the upper two floors. So, uh, and I know that that was a concern previously for um, folks interested in doing the project because you have to have a certain scale for it to make sense. So um, it's a little bit of a catch 22, I think, uh, with the expectations put on the Brown School, but I just you might want to be aware of that if you're thinking about how to prioritize any funding or advocacy the trust is doing for the Brown School. Good to know. Thank you. Um, Andy, was that for sure at this point? It is not certain, but it, it certainly looks that way from all indications I'm getting um, that, that it's not likely to to pan out at the second location. The, the feasibility study that we had uh, undertaken with an architectural firm has looked at both the Low Street site, that's the um, garage building, the old brick garage building next to the National Guard Armory. Um, we're in the process of um, going ahead to purchase that piece of, pro of the property. Uh, there was hope that youth services might re relocate there, but um, you know it, it would require bonding a project. And there's some debate, I think, about the cost of that project. Um, and I think there's also at least some debate, uh, at least in a few folks in this city, as to whether or not we retain the Brown School versus um, selling it or leasing it long term for you know 
uh, in its entirety as a housing uh, project of some type. So it, it, it seems, like I said, that it's not likely that youth services will move to Low Street, which means that uh, it's very likely it will just stay to the default. And the question will then be, um, how much money is the city willing to invest to keep youth services there? Uh, and what kind of terms would be set up for housing if they if that's the case on the upper floors? And what's the process now for like what's the timeline and all that what happens next with that? Uh, well, the the most recent thing that's going to happen is, is in the coming weeks, there there will be some sort of uh, time frame to have a presentation made to the public. So that would probably post on the city calendar and, you know, probably something in the newspaper, um, basically a public meeting where we'll present the findings of this feasibility study. So um, schematic plans for both sites, what might be, you know, possible cost estimates to go with that um, summary of, you know, the pros and cons and um, some of the needs of youth services and, some of the issues um, that the Brown School has, for instance, the, the other site is a very small structure, so it's not as much to deal with for um, upgrades or modifications, but there'll be a, uh, a presentation of, of all that information, and then there'll be a report that has it in more detail. And the question at that point will be, um, what does the mayor and the city council, what do they want to do um, in terms of uh, use services, in terms of any bonding or funding that might be needed? Um, that the question, then the question will be back squarely before the elected officials. Um, because we've gone around in the Brown School a couple of times over the years, um, a little hesitant to think that, you know, we'll have a perfect solution that comes out of this um, right away. But- You don't uh, think? Yeah. <laughs> wow. Uh, but uh, but it, it, at least perhaps, if we're nailing mm -hmm. down at least where used services goes, that's one piece of the puzzle. The, the concern I would have is that it reduces the size of the housing project that could be done above on two floors. And it also puts those two uses in closer proximity and potential, you know, um, I don't want to say direct conflict, but the types of conflicts that might rise make it a little awkward. So trying to cram those uses on the site, um, keeping some of the neighborhood playground space, um, it just seems like it's going to be harder to get someone to come in and do the type of upgrades that would be needed for even the utilities to service just two floors, essentially. So it really comes down and, and keep in mind, remember the, I think you all know this, but the council has already voted preemptively to limit the uh, the cap, the number of units that could be built there. So, um, and I think that might've been done with the assumption that only the two upper floors are used and that use services stays. Um, but that, that that's a factor there too, because right now the zoning doesn't allow uh, the number of units that the YW for instance had uh, originally proposed several years back. Well, there are other ways to skin a cat. If that, uh public hearing, uh, public presentation is scheduled. Can you guys let us know? I, I, I don't know. Yeah, can, can just that, yeah, when we end up scheduling that, Caitlin can just include that as an update to the trust. It'll probably be at least a month or so, but maybe around, maybe month to six weeks from now, maybe around that time frame, I would think. Right. Okay. Any other updates from the planning office? Um, I don't have any from, from me, Andy. Do you have any more? Nothing from me, no. Um, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm not up to speed on what's happened with the lottery, the marketing of the unit that happened, the marketing activities. <laughs> For the Busha Farms project? Yeah. Um, no, not yet. That hasn't been scheduled yet. Um, you know, the marketing plan, that was all just submitted, um, I think it was last week. Um, so they need to get a sign off from DHCD and then they'll schedule the lottery um, for that. And I'll let you know when that is. I plan on Yeah, attending. please let us know. Yeah. That would be interesting since it will be virtual. Um, it's easy to try to attend. Yep. Okay. Uh, okay, so next meeting date. October. Fifteenth uh, or the twenty second. I cannot do the twenty second. 
15th, I can. What do we say? October 15th? Okay. Yeah, that sounds good. Sound good to everybody? Yeah. All right. Excellent. Do we have any minutes we need to approve? Um, not today. Okay. Um, Andy, I'm looking at, there's like one conflict on the calendar. Um, City Council planning a development meeting. That may just be a placeholder. Yeah, that's a placeholder. Um, okay. It's not clear yet whether that will be used, so it may not be a okay. problem. Okay. All right. Anything else? Should we adjourn? So moved. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Take Thank care, you. everyone. Nice uh, to see you. Thank you. Nice. Nice to see you. Take care.